Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Vanya Hodgick, and I am the core facilitator of the Wellness Cyber Cafe. And I have an exciting guest speaker, Mr. Sean, Dr. Sean Israel. Hello. Say hello, Dr. Sean. Hello, hello. <laughs> so Dr. Sean is here today, and he's going to talk about the importance of how to be fit while you're leading. So Dr. Sean, tell us, how did you, um, a little bit about you at first. Okay. Let, let's, let's back up a little bit. Tell us about who you are and, and you know, where, you, where you're from and what are you doing today? My name is uh, Dr. Sean Israel. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I'm an educator. I'm a writer, a school leader, uh, awesome. education consultant, and um, I practice being fit so I can lead. All right, I love it. And where are you? Where are you from today? Where, where is your hometown? Okay, like I said, I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, but I moved to uh, Maryland in 2008, okay. and I've been living in this area uh, since then, um, okay. working in D.C., and awesome. pretty much doing consultant work in D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. Awesome. Thank you so much. So let's get right into the topic. Hello, everyone. We are live with Dr. Sean Israel, for those who are joining in. So... Dr. Sean, I know you've been in this field for a very long time, 20 year plus. Right. And tell me, why is it so important as a leader, whether it's you know, a school, an entrepreneur, um, why is it so important to stay healthy as a leader? Well, I think it's important because you have to stay healthy as a person first. Uh, so before you can you know, be an effective school leader, effective principal, uh, you have to be a healthy individual first, because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of other people. I know that sounds like a cliche, but uh, in terms of school leadership, this is absolutely true. And uh, in the book that I, that I wrote uh, that we're probably going to discuss a little bit, uh, The 12 Laws of Urban School Leadership, mm -hmm. the first law that I mentioned in the book is guard your most sacred assets. And two of your most sacred assets uh, or your time and your, your physical health. And okay. so as school leaders, a lot of times we go into um, leadership and want to be a principal because we want to make more money or we thinking about the prestige or in some cases the power or to be able to affect change amongst a whole school building and a whole school community. Sure. But we don't, we don't think about oftentimes uh, how that uh, change in position going from a teacher or going from whatever position that you uh, once had before you became an administrator, we don't think about the, the change that that would have on your body and how taxing that could be because you don't really realize how taxing the position is until you actually are in the position. And so one of my, uh, the first law that I mentioned in the 12 laws of urban school leadership is to guard your most sacred assets. Okay. And your physical health and well-being is, is the first uh, asset that you must, you know, and I put it in those terms, guard, because there's so many things that pull a school principal uh, in different directions and so much stress uh, that comes with the job, especially in today's climate, that if you don't uh, take care of yourself physically, mentally, and spiritually, uh, you will not only uh, not be able to do the position effectively, but you're going to harm yourself and you're going to harm the people that love you. And I know uh, a ton of principals that uh, once they became principals and got into position, they neglected themselves. And then it, it not only turned over into them having negative health, but it also had a, a negative impact on their marriage. And so many principals, both male and female, you know, their marriages are ruined and they're not with their kids and things of that nature. Uh, and it's just a trickle effect. That's amazing. I had no idea that that was such a big problem within no, the school districts. That's significant. Um, and I'd like to ask you, let me ask you this. Sure. Think back to when you were in school and from K through 12, mm -hmm. how many principals did you have that you can remember that, was, that looked actually in shape, fit, 
healthy. And Not you know, a war. <laughs> and it, it's bad, right. But, you know, when you think about a, a, a school principal, the first thing that comes to your mind is somebody who's out of shape, pot belly. Yeah. Um, barely, you know, able to move and they got a cup of coffee in their hand and donut in the other. And uh, it's not an image of a fit, vibrant, lively person. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I say that once I come into the principalship is that I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to make sure that I stay fit and I want to um, revolutionize the position in a way so that when people see me, they say, I become the image of what a, a good principal should look like and the things mm -hmm. not only in the things that I do, but how I look and how I, you know, interact with people and, and my appearance and everything like that. I like that. You know, one thing, um, I've been in a helping professional for over 20 years myself, mm -hmm. but we are actually required by our ethics to be healthy, meaning that it's, if you're impaired, we're not really able, we, we shouldn't be helping anyone. Right. Is that something that on the educational side, do you all have that ethic as well? Do you have to go by that ethical standard? I'm, I'm smiling. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> One thing that you do have, you have to, you know, you have to have to be a school principal uh, in most states. You have mm -hmm. to have at least a master's degree and you have to be able to pass a um, leadership certification test for that particular state. Okay. So that gives you your license and certification, but there's nothing attached to being uh, fit or to being healthy uh, mm. because that, that's, you know, the education requirements are a part of it, but the mm. other part is lacking. Uh, and and it's, it's uh, sad because throughout our profession, um, you can't go to a meeting most times and there not be muffins and orange juice. <laughs> Donuts, and all these yeah, carbs and all these coffee and caffeine uh, at most meetings. And then once you become a principal, um, the your your uh, position and duties change. So uh, you you go to a lot of meetings. You're interacting with a lot of people. And so uh, unless you make it a point to really be active and get out, uh, you you could confine yourself to an office or you'd be going from one room to the next and yeah. you're not getting a lot of exercise and moving around. So if you combine that with all of the carbs and sugar and caffeine, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. In addition to the natural stressors that come with the position. Absolutely. And then I want to go back because we're not per se, we have, we don't have to be physically, you know, healthy, like, you know, exercise. Nice. Um, but when I say impair, I mean mentally, right? So you're not allowed to be mentally impaired. Um, you're not, you shouldn't be working burnt out, right? That's an impairment. Um, stress, you know, because all of that kind of translate over to the client relationship or, you know, right. the student relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, you know, touch on that a little because it's, you know, um, if there was, right, if there was a little bit more healthy, um, and, and, and a little bit more advocacy for that in within the school system, you know, there might be, a, you know, a little bit more significant outcomes, you know, for, for principals and the relationship they have with their students and their families right. and their, you know, um, and their leaders. So yeah, I, I agree with you 100% because uh, the job in itself is it comes with a lot of stressors. Okay. Yeah. And Yes, you have to be mentally, um, you can't be mentally impaired. Or so if you have a nervous breakdown or some right. psychological problems, of course, they'll get you out of there. They'll get you out of there. But, right. but the stressors and the, the burnout piece, that's really hard to detect. That's something that you have to monitor on your own. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, in most cases, uh, with the principalship, especially if you're working in a high poverty, high urban area, uh -huh. uh, the stressors uh, are very, very high. Uh, you have disgruntled teachers, disgruntled parents. You have uh, issues with students. There's problems with high stakes testing. Um, you got this, uh, various stakeholders from alumni to uh, the business sector that they, they want to grab your time or they want to um, have some sort of stake in the, 
in the teaching and learning process. Uh, there's short budget shortfalls and all kind of things that go in it that, 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 that are stressors. And sure. as you know, when the body is under uh, an increased amount of stress, um, there's some negative effects. Uh, you, your, your blood pressure go up. Yes. Uh, you, you released a, your, your, your body release uh, extra hormones of cortisol and adrenaline in your, in your body, which has an adverse effects on your heart, your blood pressure, um, everything. And so you start gaining weight in addition yeah. to uh, <laughs> not eating right. So that's, that's one reason why you see a lot of uh, administrators, school administrators that are out of shape because not only are they not eating right, but the high stress put, helps them put on weight, uh, extra weight, which leads to other complications, uh, yeah. which leads to their inability to perform the job effectively. Absolutely. And like you said, the, the economical restraints, right, and, uh, you know, the violence and everything else that comes with being within a herbal, you know, within a herbal setting that just, you know, that adds to it. Mm -hmm. But if you're, you know, eating right and you're staying healthy, you're more able to kind of cope with those extra distresses. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, right. that's how I've been able to last this long. <laughs> yeah, you've been at it for a long time. <laughs> we salute you. <laughs> so going into our, our second question, you know, what aspects of, you know, your, your administration duties do you find it, you know, most challenging? Um, and, um, you know, what can you, you know, give, you know, people out there who is in the same position as you are today? Um, just some, some tools and some tips to kind of, you know, cope and get started on a more healthier you. Well, I would say in terms of uh, tips and strategies, in terms of being, you know, more fit and being able to do the uh, lead in, in a proper way, I would say it starts with a uh, proper diet and exercise. Okay. You have to uh, make sure that you go out and exercise and at least you know, three days a week. I wouldn't say you have to, you know, work out like a Olympic Olympic athlete or a bodybuilder or anything. Not happening that. anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but you do have to walk at least 30 minutes a day. Uh, try to lift some light weights or just find some uh, aerobic exercise where that, that'll get you moving and get your heart rate going. Yeah. Uh, I would also recommend that you have a proper diet where you, uh, you know, limit or totally eliminate, you know, as much sugar as possible, uh, reduce your carbohydrates, uh, try to eat uh, as much uh, raw organic fruits and vegetables as possible. And, um, you know, watch if you do choose to eat meat, you know, eat lean meats, uh, healthy meats uh, that don't have a lot of salt and, and things of that nature. I think that's a, that's a great start. Uh, yeah, yeah. in terms of just being, you know, eating right and exercising. But also, you have to have some time that you make for you uh, the, where you step away from the job, okay? Because as a principal, especially new principals, we want to get in the, they want to get into the position and they want to really do a good job and they really go hard and go all in and they start neglecting themselves and they, they uh, typically spend, 50 to 60 hours a week in the school building. Uh, they're the first one there, six in the morning. They're the last one to leave at eight or nine at night. Oh. <laughs> checking emails and going through inventory and just doing whatever they can, thinking that they want to stay on top of everything. But really, that leads to burnout. And you have to have some time for yourself, whether it's just to read a book uh, that's non-education related go on a trip, watch a movie, uh, watch a show uh, that's just bring you pleasure, spend time with family, friends, and loved ones. Those type of things rejuvenate the spirit, rejuvenate the soul, so that yeah. you can go back to that demanding position each week. And it's sad to say, but not enough school leaders uh, do that, in particularly principals, they don't do that. Absolutely. Um... And then, you know, I know you a little bit more personally. Um, you, not only are you a leader within the school, um, mm -hmm. 
but you know you also you're an entrepreneur so that's like double work <laughs> right right um so you know how do you um you know balance that the entrepreneurship your family you know your um you know your work at the school you know what what tips can you provide us on you know balancing all these multiple responsibilities well the first thing is it goes right back to being fit you know mentally spiritually and uh physically because mm -hmm. if you're not fit you don't have the energy to do all these things for one okay mm -hmm. and then uh like i said in the book guard your sacred assets your time is probably uh it ranks high with with your uh health in terms of your sacred assets is because uh, everybody has 24 hours in the day, but not everybody use their 24 hours effectively. And so a lot of people waste a lot of time doing a lot of, you know, meaningless things where, you know, my time is, um, you know, I have time to relax. Even if I'm relaxing or meditating, I'm doing something. Okay. Sure. And I take back my spare time and I use my spare time effectively and in meaningful ways. So I'm able to balance uh, effectively between being an entrepreneur, being a writer, uh, being a father, being a husband, being a school principal, and and have all these things fit, you know, uh, and have them aligned in a, an appropriate way. Absolutely. So, to answer your question, you just have to be ha able to manage your time mm -hmm. effectively, and you have to be, you know, f you know, fit so that you can have the energy and the stamina to do the things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to let go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let go of some things. And like you said, some things that are not at the high priority, that are not very important. Um, and, and like delegating too, you know, delegating, like, especially as, when you're an entrepreneur, you just have to let some stuff go. When you first start, you know, you want to do everything and have your hands and everything, but it doesn't work that way. Right. Um, and so then you start to become very, you know, stressed and disbalanced. So I think also just letting go and delegating too. Right. Know? And, and you write about that because, uh, when you're in education, like I started my career off as a, a teacher's aide, and then I moved to a substitute teacher. Then I moved to a classroom teacher, then assistant principal and then principal. And, and then I taught, I also teach at the college level and then I became an entrepreneur. So there's layers through my journey. Yeah. And so the first part of my journey, you more of a worker bee, you're a doer, okay? Yeah. You're <laughs> in the classroom, you're the teacher, you're actually hands on. But as you move up into administration and you climb up the, the administrative ladder and move up the upper echelon, uh, you do less doing and you do more thinking and planning. So my job as a school administrator is not to be the worker be to the doer, okay? My job is to, is to think and to plan and to have foresight and to try to ward off issues and problems so that the actual workers who have, you know, my teachers, my counselors, my custodians, uh, they have the things that they need so they can do their, their jobs more effectively. Sure. So if I'm, the principal and I'm actually have the wrong mindset and I'm trying to do everything and, and, and be here and there and everywhere, then I'm setting myself up for failure. Absolutely. I mentioned all that in the book in the 12 laws. Of <laughs> as well. You know, you're, you're right. It, and I think that's a, it's a learning pain. It's a, it's that, that beginning journey part that you have to really learn, mm -hmm. um, whether it's the entrepreneur or the leader, um, to let go. Um, because if you don't, you know, that's going to be your result, stress, burnout, and, um, not a good job. Right. Overall. Right. All right. So, um, Tell me about some of the major differences from, you know, working, you know, in the school system versus the entrepreneur in terms of, you know, your health and your wellness journey. Um, what are some of those, those differences you can share with us today? Well, uh, working in a school system, uh, you have everything pretty much uh, laid out for you. You have systems and structure in place, the school buildings there. You don't have to worry about paying electric bill and light bill, water bill, and things of that nature. You can just show up, they give you right. 
<laughs> and you just have to run the school, okay? And make sure the instructional program, there's uh, policies in place for, you know, how uh, teachers should behave and respond in their duties. There's the code of conduct for students. All of that is in place. Right. right? But when you're an entrepreneur, basically you have to uh, build your own structures and policies and you have to, you know, find your own work and things of that nature. And if you don't, then you, you won't get paid. Uh, but I can say that uh, for me, entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur is the most fulfilling. Uh, I, for some reason, to when I, I, agree. When I make a dollar versus being an entrepreneur versus making a dollar, uh, you know, working inside a school system, that dollar as an entrepreneur just seemed to mean so much to me. It means so much. Yeah. <laughs> My <laughs> first client. <laughs> As an entrepreneur, uh, that that money represents my own creative ideas, my own creative energy, uh, and it's like my ideas of being implemented and put into practice. Um, is I still feel that to a degree as a school leader, as a principal inside a school system, but as an entrepreneur, it's all on me. Okay, in the school system, there's layers. Uh, there's you know school staff members. And then above me, there's, you know, my supervisor, who's the chief of schools or the assistant superintendent. Above that person, uh, there's a cabinet of leaders and the superintendent. Above the superintendent, there's a school board. So there's <laughs> layers uh, 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 along the chain of command and leadership, where as an entrepreneur, there is no chain of command. It's, it's all on you. And uh, I like that. I take that as a challenge and, and I relish in being an entrepreneur. I do too. I agree. I think um, one of the other things too is always the money, <laughs> you know, because the board, you know, they already had their funding, yeah. you know, as an entrepreneur, if you don't have any funding, it creates so much other right stressors for you because that money that you're, you know, you're making from that school job or whatever other job is kind of going into your business. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of taken away from your household. And so, you know, the funding, the backup, and the assistance, right, it's, you know, that also is major. Yeah. And, and, and the principal, you know, right, how many, how many people you have to assist you? Versus well, being <laughs> it, 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 it depends on the size of the school. Uh, yeah. I've been a principal in a school where I had 65 staff members, and yeah. I've also been in a school where I've had only 20. It just depends. But even still... If, even at a school when I have 20 staff members, that's 20 people there to assist me to fulfill the school's vision and to reach whatever goals that we've set. But as an entrepreneur, that's all on you. And I can say that everybody's not built to be an entrepreneur. As an yeah. entrepreneur, you have to be a risk taker. You have to be self-confident. You have to be a forward thinker. And you have to be able to look at uh, what you're doing not always in terms of money, okay? The money is the end goal and you wanna make money and have a profit. But yeah. sometimes you gotta look at the work that you're doing and you have to build upon that work. So even if you had to take some losses in the beginning or even if you break even, because a lot of times you're taking losses as an entrepreneur uh, and the break even comes later and then the profit comes much later. Much later. But you have it might to be, be, you know, just breaking even about three or four years down the line. <laughs> But you have to be able to endure those times. Yeah. And if you're not able to endure those times and become self-sufficient and self-reliant and be able to um, just just know that the work that you're doing has positive value and you know that the money's going to come later, then you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Absolutely. And then, you know, we, we talked about the difficulty. Was there, you know, any time, point in time, you know, through your entrepreneurship experience that you just wanted to give up? I know I have many times. Um, and then, you know, what kind of stopped you, right? You know, what was your, your, your thinking, your mindset to say, well, no, I'm going to keep, you know, uh, there's something else I need to do. I'm going to keep at it. Well, of course, there's been a lot of times where I just wanted to stop, but uh, I, I'm just not satisfied with, you know, making X amount of dollars with uh, a school district because I know that I have so much more to, to offer and I know my value. Yeah. And so 
I'll tell you one particular way that I wanted to stop is because um, like when you're an entrepreneur and you have, uh, you know, certain talents and things that you have that you want to offer services to various school systems or school district or institutions that, that would like your services. So one of the services that I offer and I started out offering in a bit in the beginning was professional development and training. Okay. So that's, that's one of my strong suits. And so when I first started out, um, it was during the time where uh, school districts nationwide were really uh, on a pinch for dollars. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, levies were, and a lot of people don't understand, and I'm gonna break it down so you can, I can uh, strengthen my point. Sure, go ahead. School systems uh, receive funding, especially public school systems. They receive funding uh, from two main sources, property taxes, and from uh, money from the state, okay? So when, when uh, property and businesses uh, want to, um, well, they levy money from properties and businesses, but a lot of times these uh, property homeowners and businesses, they have to vote, okay, on how much taxes they wanna pay and so on and so forth. So if a school system put out a levy mm -hmm. and they're trying to get an increase for funds, for facilities, for, teacher salaries or what have you. Mm -hmm. And if the property tax, uh, property owners decide that they don't want to increase their taxes in order to pay for the school systems, you know, uh, cost of living or increases or whatever, whatever yeah. it may be, they can vote no on the levies and then the school systems, uh, they are going to suffer for it because they don't have enough money to function. Okay. And so what happens is I started my business in a time where this was going on nationwide, where school systems across the country, uh, uh, aside from the very affluent ones, they were uh, denying levies and the school systems were receiving less money uh, each year. And so since they were receiving less money, they were they was not hiring consultants to come in and do professional development services to teachers and other folks in the school system. Mm -hmm. They were relying on principals and other administrators to do it internally. So it was a time where I was soliciting my services and I was getting rejected time after time after time. No, 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 no. Okay, so I knew I had a good package. I knew I had a, uh, I, uh, I'm able to, you know, train and facilitate and, and I know I can deliver quality information so it can resonate with people. So I said, wow, this is just not working. What's going on? How come I'm not making dollars like these other guys? And how come things aren't opening up for me? And so what I did was I just reevaluated the situation. And then I started looking at other avenues and started to diversify. So that's the first reason when a lot of um, entrepreneurs hit that bump in the road, they quit. Okay, they say, I'm dumping money into this, I'm, I'm trying, and it's just not working. I'm gonna just go and get me a job, I'm gonna stop, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with me, uh, I already had a job and I was doing this on the side trying to build. So what I did was I said, okay, well, since the school systems are saying no, I'm gonna solicit my services to daycare providers and I'm gonna do the training for them. So then that started to turn around. So. Then I started doing um, speaking at different conferences and the conferences, I wasn't getting paid at the conferences, but it exposed me to a group of people who make decisions within school systems who later on called me and said, hey, we'd like you to come in and do trainings. So I started to pick up that way. And then I said, well, I, I know I'm good at professional development and training. So, and I'm also good at writing. Why don't I take my experiences uh, that I've learned as a teacher and as a principal, and then I start writing books. And so the first book that I wrote uh, on school leadership was The 12 Laws of Urban School Leadership. And then uh, from there, I wrote three other books uh, dealing with for school leadership. And then I wrote two books specifically for teachers. So I have five uh, books that I've authored so far. And so there's the professional development and training. And then I have the, the books, that's another lane. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, you know, just build a niche for myself within uh, urban school leadership and entrepreneurship. And then I started doing consulting. So it's the consulting, the, the books, and the, um, 
and the training and development. Wow. And that's when, you know, you, you basically you didn't give up and you started no. getting creative, right? Mm -hmm. With finding another avenue that you could, mm -hmm. you know, really utilize your services and make a living for yourself. Exactly. So that's, you know, that's basically what I'm hearing you saying. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. All right. I am having so much fun with you, Sean, today. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, as a, you know, as an educator, what, you know, if you really, you know, want to be an entrepreneur, you want to try some different things, mm -hmm. you know, what are some of the, you know, the best routes to go or, you know, way to get going? Well, I think, first of all, you have to find out what's your niche and what you're good at, your strengths. Yeah. And then once you find out uh, what are your strengths are and your niche, then you package those strengths and then you offer them to, to the world, to the public. Yeah. And so it's not about finding out what's the wave or the craze because there are, there are a lot of uh, fads that go through and people hop on and like, uh, for example, with the writing, um, everybody might be talking about one particular thing and so everybody, all the books all of a sudden will be about this one thing and then that's dead and then something else will come through. Well, with me, I decided to take a different approach. I wasn't going to just hop on every fad or craze that come through in education because those things come and go, you know, like the wind blows. So I wanted to take, you know, my experiences and my niche and my strengths and I wanted to package them, those. And so for the most of my career, I've worked in urban education and that's dealing with uh, school systems and uh, students and families that come from poverty or low socioeconomic status. Sure. So instead of um, just writing about any type of leadership or any type of the run of a mill thing that's out there, mm -hmm. I decided to focus my work on urban education because that, there, there's a void there and there's not a lot of quality uh, education books that deal with um, you know, that those particular populations, those particular school systems, because what most um, educators do, say if you're a teacher and you want to become a principal, then you go to your petition and go to some university and get into their master's program. If they accept you, uh, then you'll go through two years of, of training and whatnot. And then once you graduate with a master's degree, then you have to take a certification test. But none of your co coursework that you have prepares you for working in an urban school, especially with a high concentration of students that come from poverty or low socioeconomic status. Uh, no one, none of the books, none of the articles that you read prepares you uh, for the things that you're going to be dealing with. And so you basically will learn on the job. And a lot of times when you come out of school, there's not enough affluent, um, high performing districts that everybody can just go to. So those jobs are, are, you know, are not plentiful. So more than likely you're going to your first job as a school leader, whether it's assistant principal or principal will probably be in a low performing school or an urban school. Mm -hmm. And if you're not prepared, you're not going to be able to function in that particular environment because it's different. And especially if you were raised in a middle-class environment and then you try to come into an environment uh, where poverty is the norm, Mm -hmm. The whole uh, thought processes and, and, and social norms and practices and, and things are totally different from being in, living in poverty and living in middle class. And so these educators come in to the setting with a master's degree or a doctorate degree, but they don't have no real understanding of how to work with this population. So if you don't have any understanding of how to work with this population, then you won't be able to make any effective change. And then if you throw on those stressors and all of those different things mixed in with bad eating, no exercise, bad time management, it's a recipe for disaster. I so see. what I wanted to do was create quality uh, reading material and resources for those particular um, in administrators and teachers. So I don't care about what the fad is or what the new craze is. I'm following my lane and I'm building my niche there. So when you want to deal with urban education, uh, urban school leadership, uh, teaching students uh, from urban backgrounds, uh, classroom management in the urban school district, teaching, effective teaching and engagement, 
you had to come to me because that's my niche. I'm, I'm the man in that lane. And so I'm just building my niche. And so when people want somebody that do what I do, they got it. They're going to come to me. And so I build from that ground point. I'm not just jumping on everything. So going back to your original question, how do you start? You start from understanding who you are and your strengths. And then you put those strengths together and you package it to the world and you build upon that, building your image, building your brand, building your knowledge, your information. And therefore, the people that want your services, they'll come to you. You don't have to just try to jump on everything that's hot right now. Mm. I like, too, what you said, because a lot of times, too, if you're, you know, in a more of a, a helping role and not the leader role and you, you know, really want to get into leadership, but you're not getting those opportunities, you know, mm. per se. Nice. Um, and so you kind of just feel like you're always going to be stuck in this helping role and if you no know, one's really, you know, giving this, you know, to you. Mm. I like the fact that, you know, even though you weren't getting paid, you said, well, this is skill based. This is something that even though it's a volunteer opportunity, I'm using my skills, I'm learning and I can use this on my resume and I'm networking and building relationships so people you know, can notice me. So you get noticed at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, you know, if you're in a role that you really don't want to be in, you have to really put yourself out there. You have to be visible. Right. You know what I mean? But um, I like what you too, said about that. Yeah, the thing about that too, a lot of people, they, some people will be willing to stay in a role that they're not happy with mm -hmm. and complain versus setting a plan in motion and then working to get to where they're supposed to be. Absolutely. Okay. And so with me, yes, I, you know, I was in a career, you know, that I'm relatively happy with. With me, it just, I just want more. I just feel right. like I'm, right. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm strong. I got all my physical and mental capacities together. I can do more than what I've been doing. Uh, the principalship is not my, my end all, and that's not my limitation. And so, with me, I said, okay, I'm going to do training and development on the side and try to build a business. Uh, but the doors were closing at that point. It was just a time where the economy was bad. Uh, between 2008 and 2016, uh, the economy nationwide was just, you know, bad. People were losing their jobs, losing their homes. Of course, property taxes are going to try to, people are going to try to keep their property taxes low and they're going to vote against levies. Okay. Uh, but I, that's the time I decided to step out and, and start my business. The doors were closing. I was getting no's left and right. So I did, just decided to do something different. And so I, you know, like I said, I went and do, did those conferences and those seminars for free. And then those things gave me exposure. And then once I got the exposure, I was able to build and I was able to, you know, get other speaking engagements and do book talks and seminars and uh, things that just came to me after that. Yes, they will. They will start coming. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so tell me about, you know, tell, tell us about your books. Mm -hmm. um, tell us how they fit into, um, you know, people wanting to improve their health, you know, being well and how, you know, how does that kind of, you know, relate to, you know, leadership and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Well, like I've said, the, the 12 Laws of Urban School Leadership, that's the book that really touches on health and wellness um, among, you know, among all of my books. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I chose that particular book to be the focus of this the foundation of this yeah. conversation. Uh, but like I was saying in the beginning, without being uh, fit, you know, physically and mentally, you will not be able to do uh, the principal shit. It'll be totally impossible. Uh, there are some people that are occupying the position, but they're not doing the job effectively because of their health, uh, because of uh, their weight, because of their stamina. Uh, sure. they, they come to work, but they spend most of their time inside their office. You know, you never see them. Uh, they try to do everything via email. Or if you do see them, they're lagging around and moving slow. Uh, they can't go up on the third floor. <laughs> you know, they just stay <laughs> don't climb the steps. 
Um, if there's not an elevator in the building, you won't see them on the on the upper top upper floors. Oh, <laughs> uh, they're, they're not doing the job effectively because as a principal, you have to be visible uh, uh, within the school. You have to be everywhere. Uh, you have to be in the hallways, uh, in the classrooms, in the cafeteria, in the cafeteria, outside of the building. You have to be meeting, going to different meetings here and there. Um, and still have that visibility. And so if you're not mobile, you won't be able to maintain the proper uh, visibility so that folks can, you know, sometimes as a principal, people just seeing your presence and knowing that you're nearby or knowing that you're gonna be coming by soon, uh, that's enough to give them comfort and satisfaction or to keep them on their toes because they know that you're gonna be coming around soon. That's true. But if they know that you're not gonna come, and you won't come on the third floor, you never come in this area or so on and so forth, then, you know, it's sad to say people would do anything. You don't know what's going on. And then that type of mentality uh, is going to trickle into the type of instruction that's delivered to children. And if children aren't getting proper instruction, then uh, they won't have um, high test scores, achievement to be below, and then that causes a whole lot of other problems. Uh, the, community, mm. the community loses faith in the school. People start moving. Businesses start relocating. And then oh, no. <laughs> property taxes and property value goes down. People don't move in the community. See, people don't understand how much power and leverage that you have as a principal. Because as a principal, I have the power to revitalize an entire community. Because if the school is high performing, people are going to want to send their children there. So they're going to move into the area. If people move into the area, then business is going to be moving into the area. If business is moving into the area, people are going to spend money. If people yeah. are spending money, then the community becomes vibrant, okay? And, and, and healthy and affluent. So as a principal, you have a lot of power and people don't realize how much power that you have. And if you're not fit, you're not healthy, you don't have the right mind frame, your morale is low, you won't be able to transform that school uh, into the institution that it's supposed to be for that particular community. That's, you know, I never looked at it, you know, from that, you know, standpoint, that's why it's so important for people like yourself who has been around for a very long time to kind of expand on that and let the community know, you know, how important these issues are. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know we talked a lot about it applying to leaders and principals. Will, would this book be a good read for like teachers and people, you know, wanting to become leaders? Can this book be applicable for, you know, pretty much any educator in the, you know, working in the urban population? Well, it's, it's mostly designed for principals and aspiring okay. principals. This okay. particular book, but I do have two other books for teachers. Okay. And, um, but this particular book, The 12 Laws of Urban School Leadership, is for principals and aspiring principals. Awesome. Okay. And, uh, and then what are the other books for the teachers? In case for the people... teachers, uh, I have uh, Classroom Management, A Guide for Urban School Teachers. Okay. And then I have a book called The Cleopatra Teacher Rules, uh, Effective Strategies for Engaging Students and Increasing Achievement. Okay. And then where can we find these great books of yours? Uh, you can find all my books uh, on Amazon.com or okay. go to my personal website, which is uh, epbsconsultants.com. And it's Let me uh, type it in the chat room. Say it again. That's E, education, P, practitioners, B, better, S, schools, epbsconsultants.com. Got it. Awesome. All right. Well, at this time, wow, time has really flown. We're going to open it up to the audience. Okay. To see if there's anyone who has some questions for Dr. Sean, um, go ahead and um, send those to me. And I will uh, start asking. No questions. <laughs> Quiet. I'm getting comments. This is great. Okay. New. 
new insight on school leadership and the importance of being healthy. Awesome. Anything else? Really enjoyed. <laughs> you know, the one thing about webinars, they always kind of seem like you're talking to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like no, you know, no folks in the background. Um, I like okay, this a question. Um, what is the goal of urban leadership? What is the goal? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the goal of urban school leadership is the goal of, of any school leadership. And that's to, uh, you know, promote a solid functioning, uh, well operating school. And if you have a well operating school, then you're going to have uh, teachers that are, you know, feel empowered and, and love their job and, and have a renewed uh, sense of vigor uh, as they're, you know, doing their duties. And then if they have that type of passion and empowerment and carrying out their duties, then that's going to have a direct effect on instruction. And if instruction is delivered at a high level, then students will learn. And then we'll have, um, you know, highly educated students that will one day graduate from school and become highly productive citizens and be our next entrepreneurs and yeah. thinkers and politicians and doctors and lawyers. Yeah. But if we don't have high performing schools, then that's going to basically, for lack of better words, dumb down our citizen population. And then yeah. we'll have shortages of these high demand jobs for doctors and engineers and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lack of diversity too. Exactly, yeah. Because you want to have a, you always want to have a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we need our you know our you know, you know, labor workers, and we need our barbers and cosmetology uh, cosmetologists and you know, artists and all of those things. But we also need you know musicians. We need engineers. We need doctors, yeah. uh, lawyers. We need we need everybody to have a place and to function. There's, there's enough for everybody, whatever level they are and, and whatever their passion and desire is, but your school shouldn't limit the type of options and things that you desire. Uh, your school, whether you want to be a lawyer or whether you want to be a barber, both, both students should receive the same level of K through 12 education so that they can follow their passion. So your passion is to be a barber, then that's what you should pursue and be the best barber that you can be. Absolutely. Uh, if your passion is to uh, become a school leader, then that's what you should pursue and that's what you should be. Absolutely. And know that you can do it. Yep. It takes work, you know, it's not easy. Yep. So basically what I heard is that the goal is to have high performing schools uh -huh. that leads to high performing students right. that leads to a greater and diver more diverse work you know, work uh, population. Yep. Awesome. Any more other questions? That was a good question. Yes, it was. Guys are so quiet. All right. So, Dr. Sean, I know you, you mentioned your, your books, your website. Um, how can one connect with you um, if they want to, you know, learn more about your consulting business, um, more about your books, or just network with you? How can one, what's the easiest way to connect with you? Well, the easiest way to get to me is through my uh, website, uh, epbsconsultants.com. Okay. I also have a YouTube channel. Okay. And uh, is it your name? You yeah, uh, okay. it's, uh, Dr. Sean Israel. Okay. And I have a, a, a like page on Facebook called uh, Sean Israel Publications. Okay, awesome, awesome. I'm gonna get that information from you and probably update it on your on your bio. You can catch uh, Dr. Sean's bio on my website, www.well srcnumber1.com. Go under events. You'll see Dr. Sean's um, picture. He's looking like a boss, but he's really a nice guy. <laughs> and um, you'll see his bio. Just download that bio, but I'm going to also update it so that you can have all his contact information in case you need to reach out to him.
So we are coming to the close. I really enjoyed the session and, um, you know, definitely, you know, continue to, to um, follow, you know, this wellness, you know, cafe. It's really a great way to network, um, to learn about what others do um, and just to grow professionally. And I thank everyone for coming out and we'll see you next month on October the 10th. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. All right.